you end up with Justice League as the sort of quintessential insane journey to a director's cut. And, um, you know, I don't know that that story is ever really going to be told in its entirety, but it's a, a microcosm for like kind of what I was able to achieve with this film, but with everyone's eyes wide open and everyone really like kind of into it. Star Wars in 77 was a very, you know, it was seminal for me and for culture. It just really made me want to make movies, first of all, but also just that it transports you to another world, to another galaxy in this case. In the fall of 77, I got a movie camera and I'd made a bunch of stop action animation films with my Star Wars figures. And that continued for quite a while, um, for a couple of years. I'd say from then, I was pretty much interested in making my own sci-fi film. I was given memories of a world I will never see. Loyalty to a king I cannot serve. And love for a child I could not save. What do you think they want? Everything. Sophia was, I mean, was she a super obvious choice? For me, she was. She obviously, I think dramatically for me, really nailed what I was looking for from what Cora is. Just her, she has a sort of dark history. She's on a redemptive journey. She needs to be vulnerable, but tough. It's a lot of, it's tough. It's a, it's a complicated part. I knew immediately that uh, her sort of dance experience, her understanding of choreography, her understanding of her body and all that was super evident. My mind was blown by what she was able to do. Her work ethic, her dedication, her, in the movie, it's 99.9% .9 her. I love working that way when I have an actor who can do the fighting. I'm not trying to hide anything with the camera. I can just film the fight. So she was really just an amazing um, partner and an amazing realizing of what that character can be for me. And I really, I hope when the audience see it, they understand what you see is what you get. You know, it's all, it's all Sophia and, and thank God for her. There is a difference between justice and revenge. There is a price to pay for your defiance. I don't like making ensemble movies, although I've only made ensemble movies. 99% of the films I've made are ensemble. I don't know why I do that to myself, um, but I seem to just be addicted to making ensemble films. Dawn of the Dead, Watchmen, 300. Put a team together and go do something. Maybe it is my comfort in that arena that um, really attracted me to this Dirty Dozen style story. Being able to find a character to, to puzzle piece in to each of the roles and to make a cohesive team is something I felt pretty comfortable with. And yes, of course, my Justice League experience, Watchmen experience, those DC properties that are all about a team, those really paid huge dividends, I think. And not to mention the fact that, you know, I've constructed and deconstructed sort of that hero's journey. And so I kind of see it from both sides and that's helpful. You and I both know fear. Let's show them that we're not afraid. Let's show them we are more than the shackles that bind us. You know, it's a movie, it's a motion picture. You know, so that, that part of it, the picture taking is not to be taken lightly and it's a really, for me, they are the same. When I went to make ARMY, it felt cathartic for me to photograph the movie as well and lose myself in some ways and sort of get busy with the photography of the movie. It really became super immersive and really intense. And I really liked that. Even though there's visual effects in it, we were tricking a lot. You know, there's a lot of very organic photographic style, you know, these, the dream lenses and the skinny focus and the handheld. Then having to really do this insane technical exercise of then relighting everything with green screen, shooting TIG, inserting her into each scene, lit exactly as we did on the day with flashlights and like minimal lighting. So it was an incredible technical exercise that I really had a fun time dissecting. I, I do have a pretty technical brain when it comes to that stuff. When we came to make this movie, the fun thing was um, for a while we talked about shooting a lot of it on the volume. So there was that exercise. 
And then we ended up just building this giant village. Now it was like the best of both worlds, you know, it was like this big organic set that was real and that in big wheat fields that we were filming and for all very kind of tactile, as well as being very comfortable going onto a giant green screen set and building a big environment world that just wasn't there, you know, that I'd be like, okay guys, don't worry. There's gonna be a giant thing over there. There's gonna be a spaceship over there. There's gonna be a monster over there. So trust me, it's gonna be amazing. Let's go. For me, when I'm the director of photography, the relationship becomes even more intimate with the, with the production, with every aspect of the movie, even the actors. Because what happens when I'm operating the camera and the actor is acting for me, it's a much different relationship than being behind the monitor, behind a tent, kind of far away. And I'm like, okay, that was cool, whatever. You know, I don't know where you are, actor, you're over there somewhere, but that was great, let's go again and here's a note or whatever. Where is when I'm operating a shot, we're gonna go down to the grab the thing or hide behind the rock. I'll go with you, we'll go together to try and shoot your space gun over this shoulder, whatever. It's just much more intimate and, and I don't need to go back and doesn't go before the committee. I don't need to ask the DP. I just, I'm just, I can make all the adjustments and it's really, it's quite a different experience. The time has come for all that you love. Yes. Protect each other and show them no mercy. Who among you is willing to die for what you believe. I'd written the script, of course, in a vacuum, just as I would, you know, with my normal sort of aesthetic. It's a very hard R, very like sexy, violent, crazy. Everything's all at 11. Sort of believing in my, in my mind that when I came to actual the production, I would just be able to kind of collapse it onto like a more sort of broader audience adventure. And I think what happened with, in my conversation with Netflix, they were always like, would there be any way to like go back to your original sort of subversive R-rated version? I was like, yeah, that'd be great. And they go, then we could have like, you know, you could do your thing and we could have that as a separate piece of, of you know, content. Because my old relationship was kind of with DVD back in the day. So I would make a movie for the studio and then my relationship with DVD would be like, this, I'd kind of be done with the theatrical division, you know, who wanted the movie made. And I would just talk to DVD about like, hey, if you guys give me a little extra money, I can get you a weird, a weirdo version of the movie that you can sell again. And when people started to get to know me and get to know that, that you know, that director's cut, there was always something in it that, would, that they weren't gonna get from the theatrical version. Then it started, that started to become anthemic of what I do. And, you know, you end up with Justice League as the sort of quintessential insane journey to a director's cut. And, um, you know, I don't know that that story is ever really gonna be told in its entirety, but it's a, a microcosm for like kind of what I was able to achieve with this film, but with everyone's eyes wide open and everyone really like kind of into it. Look, and I'm super proud of the PG-13 version of the movie. I really am. I think it's really fun and it's clean and cool. But again, just the sort of weirdo darkness of the of the R-rated version. If that was sort of my original thesis for what the movie could be, that that's what we did. That's what we made in the R-rated version.